Hi there, welcome. Um, as you might have seen, I'm calling this lecture Uncommon Come-Ons. Now you might ask, what does a seduction lyric or a come-on song um, have to do with lyrical craft? And I'm going to argue that actually it has everything to do with it. For one thing, in a seduction lyric, which at its essence is there's an invitation being made, there's something being offered, there's a proposition on the table. So right there, you've got stakes. You've got something at stake on the table that is much desired, and the answer could be a yes, and it could be a no, or it could be a not right now, give me your number, or maybe I'll call you later. It also places the onus on the lyric to be distinctive in some way. And you've probably heard me rattle on, I hope you've heard me, uh, all semester, talking about the importance of being authentic in your lyrics. I keep saying, be yourself, be yourself. Find that way of saying the thing that only you can say it, even if it's been said hundreds of times before. Well, when it comes to a seduction lyric, it's been said hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions of times before. So why is it important that you find, as the lyricist, a unique way of saying it that's really you? Well, actually, there's something at stake for the listener, too. When we're being propositioned, when we're being invited into an intimate connection with somebody of whatever sort, we're looking for certain kinds of information. We're looking for actionable intelligence that we can use to make up our minds as to whether it's going to be a yes, a no, or a not right now. And what it all boils down to is, what are they offering, and am I interested in it? Well, I can only know that if I get some sort of sense of who this person is. And it's up to the lyric, up to the lyricist, in other words, to provide that information. Using all of the uh, tools you have at your disposal in your lyrical toolkit. And we've already been talking about them uh, throughout this class. So, rhyme, meter, uh, imagery, metaphor, tone the song structure itself, and plenty others. The way these are deployed, and the facility which with, with which they're employed, is going to go a long way towards determining whether the seduction is effective or not. And even if the answer isn't a yes, at least you want to make it compelling, interesting, and memorable. And that's certainly the case in all three songs that we're going to look at today. The first is by Bob Dylan. And it's kind of a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, you have the refrain, the chorus, which is one line. All I really want to do is, baby, be friends with you. Okay, well, on the surface of it, that doesn't even sound like uh, a come on at all. That's uh, strictly platonic, right? Uh, and that's only if we take him at face value. But there's plenty of good reason not to take him at face value. If not by the first or second, certainly by the third time, we get a sense that be friends with you is a playful euphemism for something more. So the verses um, are basically a laundry list of all the things that Bob Dylan does not want to do, either to you or with you. So he starts with, uh, I ain't looking to compete with you, beat or cheat or mistreat you, simplify you, classify you, deny defy or crucify you. Well, that's good to know on a first date. First of all, the barrage of rhymes uh, is a kind of um, charm tactic. Now, either it charms you or it doesn't. You might find it irritating, but uh, it's uh, whether the tactic is successful or not, it's certainly very pointed and directed. Uh, and it continues through the entire song. Um, these sort of, uh, this cascade of rhymes upon rhymes upon rhymes. Not only that, but a lot of sort of funny malaprops. So, I ain't looking to fight with you, frighten you, or uptighten you. So we get that he's persistent, he has a stick to it he's, uh, he's like a dog on a bone. And again, either you like that or you don't, but you can't deny that it is um, distinctive. Also, all this business about I don't want to crucify you, I don't want to do you in, I don't want to do all these bad things to you, well, in a sense, it's tongue-in-cheek, but in a sense, it conveys something quite real. 
Uh, and it relates to something that someone being propositioned would be interested in, which is, am I safe with this person? Are they good-natured? Um, do I get any red flags about them? Now, this question of good intentions is not a trivial matter when it comes to a seduction lyric, particularly if we place it in the uh, sociocultural context in which the song first appeared. It was written and first recorded in 1964. So that's at the very beginning of what people would call the second wave of feminism, sort of proto-women's lib. And this is a time when women are starting to imagine and expect, and in some cases demand, uh, better treatment from men, uh, questioning all sorts of assumptions about how men are supposed to be and what women are supposed to put up with. So here comes Bob Dylan with this sort of rascally, folksy chivalry, saying, uh, I ain't looking to disgrace you or displace you or define you or confine you or select you or dissect you or inspect you or reject you. Well, for all of its folksy humor, there's something very resonant about each of those words. And even um, a seeming non sequitur like dissect, I mean, if we were to take that literally, that's a humorous thing to promise not to do. But, of course, words have multiple meanings. And uh, to dissect someone is to pick them apart, to uh, analyze them, to um, not take them as a whole. And certainly all of us, and particularly uh, many women have had experiences of what it's like to be with someone who doesn't see them um, for the totality of who they are, but rather just as a, as a collection of different parts, whether physical or psychological. So these promises he's making, um, these assurances, they are reassuring, as well as being entertaining and humorous. And the ability to do both of those things, uh, sort of in one breath, is part of what makes this song so appealing. And the other thing, of course, is that there's more where that came from. So his wit is kind of an inexhaustible fountain. And we know that because all the jokes are just throwaways. They just, he just goes from one to the next, doesn't linger on any particular one. My favorite line is one that you can almost miss if, if you're not listening carefully. He says, I ain't looking to block you up, shock or knock or lock you up. So what's the word knock doing there? Well, if we apply the formula of the surrounding lyric, he's saying, I'm not looking to knock you up. He just casually drops in that, hey, I'm not trying to impregnate you. Again, on the surface, that's just an off-color, humorous um, remark. But it does have a deeper resonance, especially, again, given the sociocultural context. Uh, this is at a time when birth control was starting to become more popular. And again, the roles between men and women are being questioned. And he's telling this woman, look, you're entitled to have a good time too with me. You shouldn't have to worry about these things. And I want you to have as much fun as I'm clearly having. Shall we be friends? So moving on to our second lyric of the day, which is I'm Your Man by Leonard Cohen. And the rhyming is suave and sophisticated, um, but it doesn't draw attention to itself in quite the same way as the Bob Dylan lyric. If you want a lover, I'll do anything you ask me to. And if you want another kind of lover, I'll wear a mask for you. The lyric manages to up its own ante before it's even 30 words into itself. So clearly this is going to be a lyric that's structured around big, bold promises. And he's saying, look, I will literally give you anything you want as your lover. And if anything isn't enough, I'll give you a different version of me. So we get that he's clever. We get that he's also very intent on something and that he's willing to go to almost any lengths to secure that thing. There's also a tinge of masochism in, in the lyrics to this song, which is interesting and could be a little jarring until we discover why like what's actually at stake here, which comes in the bridge, which I'll talk about in a moment. If you want a partner, take my hand. Or if you want to strike me down in anger, here I stand. I'm your man. If you want to take me for a ride, you know you can. I'm your man. And the fact that those particular rhymes have pride of place in that they set up, they serve up the rhyme that connects to I'm your man, places them in, in, at a very uh, focal spot 
and they really connect to what he's trying to get across, that literally anything, pick me. Which begs the question, why, the, why all this um, abject supplication? Why is he putting himself in this do-what-you-will-with-me role, besides just to be a tragic, uh, poetic hero? Well, so on the surface of it, we could say, well, maybe he's being coy, like Bob Dylan. Maybe he's just, you know, showing off his poetic gifts. But actually, it goes deeper than that. And we find that out for certain, if we didn't suspect it already, in the bridge. And this song is a wonderful example of using a bridge effectively. And we've talked about this. There are many things that a bridge can do in a song, and depending on the genre, bridges have different functions. Sometimes they're just for the sake of musical and sonic variety. But certainly in the um, classic American songbook, the jazz standard, the musical theater traditions, and others, the bridge provides crucial additional information that contextualizes the entire song in a new way. So that everything that came before it and everything that's going to follow it all of a sudden takes on added depth, resonance, and we have more insight into what's driving the whole affair. So the bridge starts out, Ah, the moon's too bright, the chain's too tight, the beast won't go to sleep. So already there's um, a swift, more swiftness to these rhymes, they come quicker. So we get the sense that now he's driving at something. The urgency is building. I've been running through these promises to you that I made and I could not keep. So that closes the, the rhyme that opened with sleep. But very importantly, we get something kind of shockingly new in that lyric. He's made promises before to this person, and he didn't keep them. This is not a first seduction. This is a re-seduction. In fact, this is a reconciliation lyric. And the fact that there is a history between these two, and a very specific kind of history, where he's admitting to having broken all kinds of promises in the past. And now here he is, making a whole series of new promises. So how does he save himself from total humiliation? Well, he does a very sly little thing here, which endears him, to, to me at least, all the more. He says, he admits that this is probably hopeless. He says, ah, but a man never got a woman back, not by begging on his knees. And then there's a series of three rhymes. Or I'd crawl to you, baby, and I'd fall at your feet. Nice little internal rhyme there with crawl and fall. And I'd howl at your beauty like a dog in heat. And I'd claw at your heart. And I'd tear at your sheet. I'd say, please, please, I'm your man. But all of that is couched in a hypothetical. He starts it with, a man never got a woman back by begging. If I thought begging would work, here's what I would do. So by doing that, he's saying, look, this isn't begging. This is, this is my offer. Which brings us to the third of the three songs I want to address in this segment of the lecture. So like the Leonard Cohen song, actually, we get the sense from this lyric that this is not a first encounter between these two, or at least the lyric itself is not the first contact. It's not the first conversation. Unlike the Leonard Cohen lyric, we know that from the very start. Uh, we get the sense that these two are alone together um, in some intimate setting. So then what is this seduction about? This seduction is about going further, and it's an invitation to go further and deeper into a more meaningful, more transcendent kind of connection. So the chorus is a key part of how this functions. Uh, this is the one song we're looking at today that has what I would call a proper chorus, so more than just one, one line. The Bob Dylan song had a one-line refrain. It's pretty straightforward. We get what he's saying. Uh, it doesn't change much over the course of the song. Uh, the Leonard Cohen song has even less than that. It has just a hook, a one-line hook that ends the A sections. The song is essentially uh, an A-A-B-A. -A. Here, this is a verse-chorus song, and as a good chorus should, it contains the heart of the message of the song, and it accrues more and more meaning and more depth the more times we hear it. It starts with a series of commands. Come here. Stand still. Those are both terse, two-syllable, very succinct, direct, 
forthright instructions as to what she wants this person to do. Now, I don't hear that as domineering, but I do hear it as assertive. This is someone who clearly knows what she wants. I hope that you have got all night because I'm not done looking. I'm not done looking yet. Well, the repetition of I am not done looking, I am not done looking yet, Again, that drives home the sense that this is someone who knows what she is looking for, and she will know when she finds it, and she has not found it yet. And she's patient. Now, that patience is also conveyed by the rhyme scheme itself. If you take a look at it, come here, stand in front of the light, stand still so I can see your silhouette. I hope that you have got all night, because I am not done looking, I am not done looking yet. The rhymes couldn't be further apart from each other, and yet they're there. The whole thing is, in a sense, very relaxed, it's patient, it's poised, it's willing to take its time. And yet, mixed with that patience, it's not lackadaisical or laissez-faire at all. It's very intent. Now what we don't know is exactly what she's looking for. Why does she want to look at this person's silhouette? What is she not done looking at yet? Is it just the physical form? Well. This is what the verses are for. I search your profile for a translation. So in what I see, I'm looking for some kind of meaning. I study the conversation like a map. Little internal rhyme there. The uh, strength in the differences, the comfort in the congruences. And she wants both. She's not looking for just differences or just similarities. She's looking for the whole picture. Now, that's all still quite gentle, until we get to the second verse, where things start to get a bit more pointed. Each one of us wants a piece of the action. You can hear it in what we say. You can see it in what we do. Well, okay, but it sounds a little bit philosophical. It's kind of general. Each one of us. Well, how many people is she talking about? She's speaking very generally about human beings. So she's talking about humanity in much broader terms than just these two people here in the scene, which is a bit oblique. It raises the question, well, what's, where is this going? Next line. We negotiate with chaos for some sense of satisfaction. If you won't give it to me, at least give me a better view. Come here. And we're back into the chorus. So she's placing this, what could be a, otherwise a very prosaic, um, encounter in the big city in a much bigger, uh, almost spiritual context. And she's inviting uh, the person she's with to step up and to provide that better view. There's a vulnerability that she's asking for, and there's also a vulnerability that she's exuding and demonstrating by asking for it so directly. And that turning on a dime from the general to the specific is something that Ani DeFranco is brilliant at. And the sense of urgency builds and culminates in the third verse. Now, interestingly, she makes the third verse double the length. So she delays the punchline. And I don't know you that well, but it don't take much to tell. Either you don't have the balls or you don't feel the same. Come here. Of course, implicit in that line is an admission that this may be a lost cause. Either you don't have the balls or you don't feel the same. Because you're not showing me that you're up for this. I may have lost already here, but damn it, come here. Stand in front of the light. Stand still so I can see your silhouette. I hope that you have got all night. I hope. I don't know, but I hope. So again, the what can sound bossy is actually revealed to be a very vulnerable state of asking for something. Clearly, directly, with no apologies, and with no guarantees of a yes. And in some sense, that's the most inspiring kind of seduction there is, the most authentic sort of um, proposition there is, because really there are no guarantees.